Good morning. Uh, this is a part of the uh, heritage series of videotapes uh, whose intent it is to preserve the interesting history of Cincinnati Children's Hospital uh, through the eyes of those of us who have uh, been uh, more than a small part of that. The three of us here uh, represent over a period of uh, 33 years totally, probably some 86, 87 years of doing dentistry and all in this location. Uh, the history of uh, the organization predates the three of us by, uh, by a considerable amount. Uh, there has been a dental service affiliated with the University of Cincinnati for a long, long time. Uh, in fact, it emanated out of the, uh, de the Ohio College of Dental Surgery, which was here. Uh, it was founded in 1845, actually, and it was the second d dental school in the United States. And over the years, uh, that school had uh, made uh, interconnections with the university through the College of Medicine. Then in... Uh, when that school closed in 1929, uh, dentistry was then represented by uh, the division or the Department of Dentistry, uh, which in fact was a division of surgery at the uh, what was then the General Hospital. And uh, in the uh, mid-50s, there was a need to uh, expand that service from general dentistry into the area of pediatrics. And uh, that was sort of the beginning of the opportunity for the three of us to come together. <coughs> the Children's Dental Care Foundation was, uh, was an organization of primarily lay people that was founded for the, uh, with the mission of providing dentistry to uh, children who didn't have access to the service. Many of those children were without, their families were without financial resource and, uh, and many of them were chronically ill. Uh, rheumatic fever was a, a major disease of children in those years. And uh, that certainly had dental implications. But at any rate, uh, the organization developed um, primarily over through the efforts of three people uh, at the university. Uh, Dr. Bob Schell was an oral surgeon who ran the uh, division of dentistry um, um, at the General Hospital. Bob Holly was uh, sort of his right-hand man for pediatrics for a number of years. Uh, and probably one of the most subtle influences on the development of that organization was a pediatrician by the name of Bob Lyon. Uh, Bob Lyon's influence and impact on, uh, on some of the uh, little recognized but major problems of pediatrics in a community sense uh, really are legendary. They just don't get the uh, press they should, I think, sometimes. It really was because of Dr. Lyon that I ultimately made the decision to come here and, and the three of us come together. He was a very strong influence in the development of the Children's Dental Care Foundation and the Division of Pediatric Dentistry. But at any rate, um, in 1963, the Children's Dental Care Foundation, which had been in existence then from, it was really incorporated in 1955, uh, had to make a decision about what they were going to do here because there was a uh, requirement then that people trained in pediatric dentistry uh, had to uh, um, be trained in an accredited program. And so accreditation of the uh, division here became an important
piece of the action if they were going to continue to train uh, pediatric dentists. The option they had was to just become a pediatric dental service and let the uh, training program uh, disappear and be taken over elsewhere. But uh, fortunately for us, they made the decision that they were going to uh, reach out and uh, try to develop a bona fide residency training program accredited by the American Dental Association. So they went looking for people and to my good fortune they found me in Chicago <coughs> as I was just completing my training at the uh, Children's Memorial Hospital. Uh, when I look back on it, I think it was a little presumptuous on my part to think I could just uh, come out of my training program and open up my own. But that's exactly what we did. And Dr. Steinle uh, uh, and I were students at Northwestern. We were in our graduate training program together uh, with a year between us. And I came down here to, uh, to spend a year and see what the situation might be like for the division and the ultimate development of a residency program. And after I got here, I realized what, a, what an absolutely marvelous place this was to do what, what I knew I felt ought to be done, and I knew that Dr. Steinle felt that way. So I called you up and, <laughs> and invited him to join us here in Cincinnati. And uh, when I get through, Historically, here you can tell us how you felt when uh, when that happened. But uh, uh, at any rate, we got together and we started on our way to getting an accredited program. And it was finally accomplished in uh, what Cliff about 1967, I think we got the final accreditation. Right. Somewhere. And then uh, it began to build tremendously. The patient load was. Uh, fantastic and uh, things were just developing well and we decided we'd better look for another person. And then we discovered Dr. Steiner who was in training at, uh, at uh, Children's Hospital in Columbus. And we could tell some funny stories about our first meetings with Dr. Steiner but We'll save that for later. I'd like later. to hear those. We'll yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm going to learn some stuff here, maybe. Yeah, you might. Yeah. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, when was that, Jim? 1969? Yes, right? it was. And, uh, I can and tell some funny stories. I'm sure you could. And the three of us have been together ever since. And uh, uh, it's been a great marriage. And... Uh, since this, this is rather appropriate, I guess, that we do this, since I'm looking toward uh, stepping down here at the end of the year. And uh, um, so we'll leave it to, uh, well, actually, Cliff and I both are going to do that. And we'll leave it to this youngster here to carry on. <laughs> <coughs> but the division has grown tremendously and from this little... Well, the first dental clinic uh, was in the basement of the old children's hospital. Uh, By the loading dock. Yeah, right, right, next door to the loading dock. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've moved around a lot. Uh, that was a little three-chair uh, operation in the basement. Um, a lot of the equipment was donated was good stuff though it lasted a long time um, <clears throat> and an interesting fact that I think we all ought to talk about is is the fact that and I'm sure other people have recognized this <laughs> before we did but we had satellites in the neighborhoods around the city before having satellites was fashionable <clears throat> Dr. Lyon through the uh, baby's milk fund um, and the Child Health Association developed those neighborhood clinics and he took us along as the dental department uh, really through the efforts of our predecessor Bob Holly. Uh, those, those were all established when we, uh, we took up residence here. So, 
but we think it's kind of interesting that we have come, come full so cycle and uh, neighborhood clinics are now the thing to do and to reach out into the community. Uh, the Baby's Milk Fund has a long history of doing that. And those were uh, interesting facilities that we worked in in those days. <laughs> we started with two residents. We were in, what, 65, I think we are, took, exactly. our, took our first two residents. And of course, we couldn't get that program accredited until those two guys had been here for full two full years. So we owe a lot to the both of them uh, uh, yeah. because they took a gamble. To yeah, but one of them didn't stay for but a year. Right. Do you remember their names? You think? Yeah. The fr uh, there was a young man from Chicago, uh, Chuck Kirkland. Chuck Kirkland. Mm -hmm. And then Dr. Al Posey, uh, who now practices out in Enid, Oklahoma. And uh, I had the <coughs> pleasure of being with Al a month ago at the uh, ADA meeting. And that was a great, uh, that was really a reunion because I hadn't seen Al for 25 years. So, um, But even though uh, they didn't stay, they were here long enough to get, well, Ch Kirkland actually did. Right. He stayed till the end. But so we had one in the first year, yeah. and we took two more the second year. That's right. And that was um, Blutner and Campisi, and one of those right. left. And now we're asking ourselves, what are we really <laughs> doing right? You know, should oh. we be here at all? Oh, I and then we took four the, yeah. final, the third year. And have had four or five ever since, yeah. and nobody has left since then. Yeah, we haven't. We haven't. Had so we must have cleaned up our act pretty good by so then. Let's not say that too loud. We haven't lost a resident in a long, long time. So. No. Nope. Yeah. Well, when I came too in '69, there were eight residents. Yeah, that's uh, right. So that was, I think, the first year that we we had eight. We had accomplished that. Leon that. and yep. Marie and uh, I think was it Beaker in that. First year, I don't know, Tom Sitzer and Jerry Albrecht and Kenny Roy and uh, Jim Beaker. Was he in that group? I don't know. But anyway, there were eight. Right. And we accomplished that, remember, through the opportunity to open a satellite in Good Sam Hospital. I, I yeah. don't remember that. That's where we did it. Yeah. And that was the opportunity. They wanted to uh, put some pediatric dental services in there. Uh, they, they then had a department of pediatrics. and. Uh, so we went over there. And well, I remember the beginning just a little differently than you. Uh, <laughs> have <laughs> wordsmithed it <laughs> uh, on this be occasion. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, <laughs> my memories were that uh, we used to brown bag it quite a bit down in that wonderful little uh, area to eat at <laughs> Face oh, Northwestern. We school, yeah, right. And then uh, you left, and uh, I got a phone call uh, like, you were coming to the um, midwinter meeting, and let's get together and talk about it over <laughs> dinner. Well, <laughs> dinner was liquid, as I remember it. Was this a setup? Do you think? Uh, I don't know, but okay. boy, I tell you, you know uh, me we well discussed enough to know it. that it was right. I know you very well. Yeah, and it was a setup. <laughs> you didn't I, even know what was going to happen. I remember going home, and uh, kind of climbed in the bed or poured in the bed, and uh, my wife said, uh, "Well." What's happening? I said, how would you like to go to Cincinnati? And her comment was, Cincinnati where? <laughs> and I, I mean, that's my recollection of the very start. Um, but um, Yeah, I remember that well because she didn't talk to me for a I year. I know, <laughs> about a year or so. <laughs> uh, but uh, you mentioned those uh, early clinics. Um, and Dr. Lyon and uh, Dr. Weil and Dr. Rao. Louise Rao and uh, those oh, Saturday yeah. morning uh, cardiac clinics. Oh my goodness. But I think the most memorable one for me was um, the cerebral palsy clinic over on Victory Parkway, where it was on the second or third floor of that old building. Right. And Jim, that's probably the first time I dumped on anybody right yeah. there. That, uh, you, you mean you dumped on him? I did. Because oh, I'd man. been doing that alone. and. Uh, when I got him here, uh, I quickly assigned that responsibility to him. You, 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 you'd, you'd climb up those back stairs and they go crickety, 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 and you go into this room and, oh, I mean, 
we had, you're right, the equipment uh, was good because it lasted for a long time. It did. From the time of GB Black, I think. <laughs> yep. And uh, then the patients would clop down the, that corridor and in walks Jackie Hagedorn, mm -hmm. who cussed you Jackie. out from mm -hmm. one end of your body to the other. Mm -hmm. And she would tell you how much she really didn't want you to do dentistry on her. And oh, wonderful. She stayed with you a long time. She sure did. Yeah, she did. Um, and then Shell Clinic, you know, um, uh, that was a part of our history that... Uh, yeah, that's right. That has a lot of memories for There me. was a... The history of the Shell Clinic is that uh, uh, the Children's Hospital at that time, in order to be a patient uh, in the outpatient clinics, uh, you really are required to... Uh, this is long before their affiliation with... Uh, with the uh, university in which we, the hospital took over the entire um, pediatric uh, care, uh, you had to be a patient of record in the hospital for a year, remember, in, or mm -hmm. in order to get in a clinic. And so that presented problems for the Children's Dental Care Foundation, who was really reaching out into the community to try to solve some of these uh, dental access problems. And and those kids actually couldn't get into the outpatient clinics uh, at Children's unless they had been patients of the outpatient department previously. <clears throat> so the uh, Children's Dental Care Foundation came up with the idea of building a, a small, uh, I guess you could call that a satellite too, although it was only just down the street from the hospital. Um, and. Uh, Dr. Jack Rubenstein was very instrumental in, in all of that because uh, the Cincinnati Center for Developmental Disabilities, which was at that time called the Hamilton County Diagnostic Center, were yep. mentally retarded. Mm -hmm. Yep. They were down on the corner of Erkenbrecker and they had a garage, a three car garage in that building, next to the building, which uh, he uh, <coughs> and the board of, of uh, his organization donated to Children's Dental Care Foundation, and they built what it what they subsequently uh, called the Shell Memorial Clinic, in honor of uh, Dr. Shell, who passed away in 1963. And the doors opened uh, later that year, <coughs> and uh, in his honor, that place was. Uh, used and used and used. <laughs> and abused. Uh, right. Uh, it was a th the three-car garage turned into a three-chair dental clinic. I remember the halls were so small that you, you couldn't, it was hard to turn around in there without bumping your elbows. Couldn't and it was hard with wheelchairs, too. Uh, I was going to say, real challenge. I can remember trying to get patients on a gurney in yeah. there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> he could not negotiate the turn. But but I think it was probably our state of the art place at that point, you know. It, it, was, it was. It was. Yeah. First of all, because some of that equipment was purchased brand new. Uh -huh. The Dental Care Foundation went out and found donors for uh, uh, to provide equipment to put in there. So it really was uh, for us it was a grand place to work, and it and it certainly did yeoman service because I remember the day that we finally decided to close it, and uh, I mean the sinks were all stopped up, the the bathrooms were were plugged. I mean there was just you oh. couldn't use that place anymore. D you know, it was used up. D do you remember when? And and you'll remember this when the uh, uh, the street culture folks over from Vine Street and we oh, were running an yeah. evening clinic. That free clinic. The free clinic. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I do. Want to say a word about that? Yes, I this do. This was in the seventies, uh, early seventies. Since 70s. that also was an assignment of yours, you want to say a few <laughs> words about that? Oh, I mean, going out into the waiting room and looking at that purple smoke. Uh, <laughs> I mean, just <laughs> yeah. There was a no sm Everybody, you smoked everywhere. Everywhere, you know, everybody. Did, but that yeah. was an experience because that was my first uh, real interfacing with the dental community. Because mm -hmm. uh, we asked them to volunteer to provide the services for the yep. kids at that time. And for the most part, uh, they did. They did. Uh, there was and, a core uh, of, uh, of uh, hygienists, dental assistants, and dentists. That right. 
and we educated service. some of them um, about uh, hepatitis and AIDS, and <coughs> which wasn't known at that time, but uh, all the other problems. Infectious um, disease. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it has a long history. <laughs> um, well, I still have a dental cabinet from the old Shell Clinic that, yes, I you know, I kept, do you have one? I think. I, it's an old time, like, 1890 dental cabinet, and I, uh, I heard it was going to be torn down, and I said to somebody, you know, I want to get a cabinet out of there before it's torn down. Well, somebody called me about an hour before the wrecking ball was going to hit it, so I had to rush down and grab that thing. Mm -hmm. It was, it was neat. It's in my uh, family room. Still got it. Uh, had it refinished. Um, I, I, if you guys don't mind, uh, let me just Go share with you my thoughts about when, when I came. I was a, a second-year resident at Columbus Children's and, of course, had absolutely no idea what I was going to do. And... Uh, when I finished my residency, what I was trying to do was find a job in Europe. And uh, I'd been writing letters all over and uh, hadn't gotten much in the way of a response. So my chief at the time uh, knew Bob and Cliff. And uh, he came in one day and he said, Steiner, he was a little, <coughs> little uh, heavy handed, I think you could say. <laughs> Steiner, uh, there's two guys out here who want to talk to you. You got time? I said, yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. So I go out and it's Bob and Cliff. And I sit down with him. Uh, it was a very busy clinic, and uh, we tried to find a quiet spot and sat down and, and started chatting with him. And I always remember that Bob did all the talking, and Cliff just sort of sat and watched me. And uh, uh, at, at the end of the conversation, I realized that they were asking me if I was interested in a job. I wasn't quite sure what, what was going on. So I, you know, I said, gee, what a great idea. I'd love to do it. And my wife and I, uh, a little different than Cliff's wife. She really liked Cincinnati, and so did I. But, you know, we grew up in Ohio and uh, knew about Cincinnati, and we said if we ever stay here, we'd consider staying in Cincinnati. So the next step was to come down and see the place. And uh, you probably don't remember this either, but Bob invited me down on a Saturday morning when uh, things were kind of quiet, but we had a, a Saturday morning clinic over at the old General Hospital and that's when Carl Weil was running the adolescent clinic over there. And uh, I, I remember meeting Bob in a, a refurbished apartment building, which was across the street from the Proctor Wing back then. And that's where the dental clinic was. That, that was sort of the main base of operations. It was the first floor of an apartment building. And that's where I met Bob. And Bob and Cliff had offices in the back of that space. and uh, it looked like they were kind of both sharing a closet. It was, it was not what you'd call palatial been, space. Been, yeah. uh, it, well, it was actually kind of a bedroom, I think, that had been converted to an office. And their desks were door tops. And they were on saw horses. <laughs> they were kind of, you know, kind of like that. It was got to start. You got to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere. Yes. So uh, that's where I met uh, Bob. And uh, Bob took me over to the uh, general hospital through this system of tunnels, and uh, I, I went into the clinic, and it was in this, it, it was kind of like a bunker. It was concrete blocks, and there was a reception area, and the clinic was in like a long, narrow room with two chairs facing each other, and you had to squeeze between them. But, you know, it just really appealed to me. I thought, you know, they're doing things. They, they don't have a lot of support, but they're getting things done. Pretty laid back. Uh, and uh, so I was interested, and we began to talk, and I ended up here in uh, July. And I, I said to Bob, well, when would you like me to come? And Bob said, eh, whenever you get around to it. And so I ended up here in mid-July, I think, and uh, uh, eventually did find a job in Europe, though, and that, that's another interesting story. Uh, while I, when I came, I, I asked them if it would be okay. I asked both of them if it would be okay if I still kept looking for a job, and they said, sure. So. I did, and I... We weren't sure we could pay any longer than a year. Yeah, right? that's right. And the <laughs> pay was, actually, wasn't that bad. It was a lot more than I was making. And uh, so uh, I kept looking for a job, and the way I found it was kind of fascinating, too. I'd sent letters to a clinic in Switzerland and uh, hadn't heard anything from the director. I'd run across an ad in a, in a dental journal and uh, sent an sent a application to him on a CV and never heard from him. So I was having lunch one day, and I was sitting next to Fred Silverman, and I was telling Fred this story, and he said, well, Jim, 
He said, let me introduce you to Herb Kaufman. Herb is the chief of radiology at the Children's Hospital in Basel, Switzerland. And maybe Herb can help you uh, find this job or you know, run interference for you. So I, I really didn't understand the Swiss mentality at that point. But after having lived there for a period of time, I do. But Herb said, well, I can't recommend you unless I interview you. So I had to have a formal interview with, with this gentleman. And he apparently uh, thought it was, it was OK to go back and uh, push for a job for me. So about two weeks later, I, I got the job in Basel. And I left for a little over a year. And uh, then, you know, when I left, I said, well, guys, you know, you don't have to hold the job for me, but I'd sure like to come back if it works out. And fortunately, it did. And that was in 71, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. he, he mentioned Fred Silverman. And I think as you think back on uh, the development of the whole division, there were some very, very key people in the mm -hmm. medical center. And probably, as you mentioned already, the, uh, the person who we owe the most to is Bob Lyon. Uh, I mean, a greater gentleman I have not met. Mm -hmm. uh, you include me in that? Yep, I okay. sure do. Uh, um, and then um, Fred Silberman with the training program. The hours that he spent with the residents were, uh, he, his schedule was so busy. And he, but he did spend time with our residents every week. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Even the medical students were envious of the time that he spent with our residents. Yeah. And then Ed Pratt, I mean, what he did for us on an administrative level. Um, uh, he was a good friend. Sam Kaplan, you know, I mean, all these well, people. Well, I was going to mention Sam because he took an interesting role when we, when we were accredited, if you yeah. remember. <coughs> no, you touch on a very important part because one of the hallmarks of this program and I don't need to tell you guys this, but known all over the country is the great rapport and interaction we have with our pediatric mm -hmm. cohorts and um, colleagues. Um, and, and that is as strong today, stronger today than it was then, but it could not have happened had those people not been willing to participate and and that foundation was being laid long before the three of us came on the scene, actually, and we just kind of inherited that. And that was, that was what, you know, what I saw when I first came here was that the opportunity was, the soil was very, very good here. And Sam, you remember when, when we uh, were going to be accredited, and we finally got ready to do that, and the dean of the Dental school at Indiana came over to do our accreditation visit. Who I, is that? Ralph McDonald. Ralph McDonald. Okay. Yeah, in fact, I'm Mr. not sure that he was dean then. I I think he I was perhaps um, uh, chairman of the department at that time. I don't I don't remember exactly when he he would have been chair took over yeah. the deanship. But at any rate, a very uh, renowned individual in pediatric dentistry and. So he came over to make the site visit. And residency programs in dentistry, uh, particularly in pediatrics, were not very uh, widespread at that point. And then people had not had a lot of experience in what ought to be included. And so he, I recall, interestingly, that, that he asked us more questions about what ought to be in a program than, than he looked at in our own program. And I remember mid-afternoon, uh, as we were trying to finish it up, we got a call, and it was Sam Kaplan uh, requesting that Dr. McDonald be certain to stop by and visit him before he left. <laughs> and I, I was so amazed by that because uh, we had not really set up anybody to uh, vouch for us. They just knew that it was going on, and they came forward and. Uh, Sam sat and talked with Ralph for, gosh, the better part of an hour. The other uh, individual that was kind of uh, instrumental in that whole, at, at, in that time period was Jack Rubenstein. Absolutely. Um, because not only did the training program, was it getting off the ground, but the administrative part of the whole thing was getting off the ground and, and the relationship with the university and something that was, <laughs> you know, uh, important to us was, uh, was
was pay. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, pay. When we started, <laughs> I think we were paying them, as I recall. Um, you know, together under Jack Rubenstein and Ed Pratt. Yeah, that was the opportunity for us to really begin to grow. Because yeah, but do you remember the funniest damn thing? When we had developed probably four or five years into this thing, and we had really kind of left Ray Gilby out of the <laughs> out of there, the loop, out of the name. loop. Mm -hmm. But we had to go over and get a signature on something. And I'll never forget the day that you and I went over there, and he looks at this thing and he goes, when did all this happen? <laughs> you know, <laughs> when did this happen? Did he sign it? He signed it. Okay. <laughs> but it was so funny because we kind of just went our way and yeah. uh, with the help of all these yeah. other people. But wasn't uh, he sort of the, the titular head of... Yeah, he was a professor of dentistry. Oh, he was. Professor of dentistry, oh, was. Was. Professor of dentistry okay. right. Because yeah. I remember Bob taking me over to meet him oh, yes. he, when I came. He uh, acceded to the throne after... Uh, after uh, oh, Dr. Shell died. Yep. And so at any rate, uh, but that opportunity uh, through Jack Rubenstein really is what, where we began to open up some space. Because uh, okay. that affiliation uh, at that time meant that, uh, that that was the beginning of the Children's Hospital Medical Center. Remember, and all the affiliates began to come together and talk about uh, developing this uh, much enlarged medical center that would really sort of be a one-stop shopping center for all these kids that were being seen by these various affiliates uh, um, in other locations. Um, and that was when the pavilion came into being uh, because it was through Jack's effort that that building was built. and. And um, we have always been a part of his training program as the dental department for uh, CCDD, and so we we we've been together a long time. That was a, that was I guess our first big move yeah. uh, to the pavilion. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, we we, really, we, we really had that were two joining, center deal. That's Remember right. That? We, we were joining two yeah. facilities. That's why. Yeah, but, but that was. The hospital was in two center, and then the Shaw Clinic was down the street. Yeah, and, and that's you, really why you know we were in that old apartment building over there because we were being moved when you. Uh, that it was the start of okay. of moving us around. Prior to that, we were on what was two center at that time. And for those who may not know where that old apartment building was, it was right across the street from the ranch house. Yeah, right. <laughs> Wait, wasn't it next door to it? Next door, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, yeah it was, there yeah. was a street yeah. between a, them. Yeah. Oh, there was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There was a yeah, street. That, those were all houses when I came. Right. It was a residential area. Right. Well, yeah. I'm sure people well, will remember the ranch house. <laughs> Fluid around. Pe people hell. from our vintage will. I'm yeah. sure we're not the only ones talking about the ranch house on these heritage series. <laughs> that was a famous building. Uh, well, you know, the thing that, that you might want to talk about too is the craniofacial team and how that got started. Well, I was thinking about that. I, uh, we certainly want to include that because that the history of that thing covers as much many years as. Uh, as we've been here. Uh, I was just going to kind of wrap up the pavilion segment by saying, you know, we, we, we were in that building for 20 years. Uh, mm -hmm. and when we uh, began to talk about moving out of there, I couldn't believe that, that we'd been there that long. And uh, there, was a, there were a lot of residents that went through that facility and uh, a lot of dentistry emanated <coughs> from there. Uh, but you mentioned the craniofacial team. That, when I came here in 1963, I, I had developed an interest in, uh, in uh, craniofacial disorders as a resident at Children's Memorial in Chicago. And uh, Northwestern had a big, well-renowned cleft palate team at that time. It still does, as a matter of fact. And so I came here, and one of the sort of side ventures was to try to duplicate what I had left there in some fashion. And uh, 
And that's when I met Dr. J.J. Uh, Longacre, Longacre <laughs> yeah, who was really at that point in time and had an international reputation in, uh, in uh, cleft lip and palate. And uh, so we began to try to work with Dr. Longacre and, and develop some semblance of a team. And it never, never really gelled. It, it just, uh, it didn't really ever get off the ground. We, we, we were a part of it, and yet we weren't a part of it. And so, <clears throat> I can't remember when it happened, but it was after uh, Robin Cotton came aboard that he also had an interest in this area, and and with Lester Martin's help, you know, you know we began to. A get together right. a nucleus. You know who played a role in that was Liz Applin at that time. Absolutely. Because she wanted a coordinated approach to, yes. uh, to these patients. And she, she, she was became, with the state. Right, yeah, she yeah. was with the Bureau. Well, it was then called the uh, Cripple Children, so, Bureau of Cripple Children Right, Services. and I mean, talk about having an alloy, an alloy, yeah. an ally in the right spot. Uh, it was Liz Applin and, and Cripple Children's because she really put pressure on everybody to, to bring that to a, uh, a coordinated effort for those kids. And at that time, I think J.J. was, was kind of... Well, yeah, his, yeah. his effort had been going on a long time. Yeah. And basically, that team was, was really built out of his private practice. That's right. what it was. And, um, and we were just kind of participants in all of that. But, um, what, and you're absolutely correct, Liz Applin, wanted to do something to get better coordination in the effort for cleft lip and palate kids and and she was willing to fund the very first coordinator mm -hmm. um, i'm trying to remember who it was sue mathers sue, Ma sue mathers right she drove a porsche <laughs> she drove a better car than <laughs> not I on what we were paying no that's true. i don't know where she got <laughs> but, it but. but liz bless her heart was uh you know she sort of had the same outlook on doing things as we did. I think that's why we had a, why we had a fit because uh, you sort of get the idea, you push, you push, you push, and then you figure out how it's going to pay for itself and work and, and cut and out all the red tape. And that's exactly right. And, and Liz would not be happy trying to function in today's world because of that. Um, but at any rate, that gave us the start and. Uh, and that organization still goes on today, and it's uh, it is now a craniofacial team um, with the uh, help of many practitioners uh, who sit on that team and represent uh, a variety of disciplines. Very, very, very active team now. So. Um, and still has a future, a long way to go, and there's much more that can be done in that area. I can remember, I'm thinking back to the old uh, children's hospital that still exists, and when we used to do cases in the operating room up there, and how small it was, and we would do maybe two cases a week, mm -hmm. and right. uh, today we're doing 10 to 12 a week. Yeah, the service has just grown by leaps and bounds, I think. Uh, and it's because I think of what you were talking about earlier, how, how we are appreciated and respected by the, our medical colleagues here, and uh, they've been very supportive. That's an interesting point. I was looking this morning just to get prepared for this little series. I, I looked at the first... You cheated and did the, some homework. Right, I did. I looked at the first report that came out of the Dental Care Foundation. <clears throat> the first annual report that they actually produced, and they had seen 1,500 patients that year. And how many did we see this last year? Over 20,000. <laughs> <laughs> so it's grown a lot. Uh, yeah. But you, you know what's helped that, too? Um, the, the dream that we had in that basement where we were really not happy with um, the way Northwestern, which was... You know, at that time, it was uh, a premier program. Oh, yes, you bet it was. But yet we found that we thought there was a, a different or a better way to do it. 
And I think what has allowed us to grow is the fact that we put that into operation and people have accepted it. And the, yep. the, the residency has grown and the philosophies that we, we started and we had back in those days are still being carried on. Right. You know, right. and it was, a, it was a philosophy of education that it's That's not right. that uh, um, conventional um, undergraduate approach to things, but it was a, it was a more, um, uh, I guess, graduate, for the lack of a better term, approach to the education. Right. And w it was a medical model that we decided uh, to develop and how that thing has grown in, and I think um, has allowed us to expand the residency to the point that we have it today. Right. And, and you know, I can remember, <laughs> you know, you were talking about the first class, and uh, when I first came, I, I'm not even sure where the candidates came from, and we didn't really have a very organized application process. And, uh, you know, nowadays we'll get 120, 30 applications, for four or five positions, and back then I, I don't know how many we got, but they were sent to us by our friends. That's I think so, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know now, uh, the reputation <coughs> of the program is is so good that you know the number of applications we get is just overwhelming. Uh, well, Cliff is absolutely right on the money because it's it's an educational philosophy that the specialty of pediatric dentistry, from the time I considered going into it, has changed so much from just uh, filling teeth and restorative practices. That's, that's really what they were. Um, you can remember uh, the guy from out in Kansas City uh, who, who did gold. Kenny in, Lawrence. Kenny Lawrence yeah. did gold inlays in, in primary teeth. Oh, I mean, sure. It, it, was, it, was, it was a fellow it was, down in, in... It was an artisan's trade. Yeah, but uh, there was a fellow down in um, Texas who did that too. And his, his rationale was that for the school children that would have to take those uh, bus rides back and forth to school and down dusty roads that uh, the stainless steel crowns would, would, wear, out. would wear out because of the <laughs> dust being ground in them. So he, he put uh, gold in, you know, I'm thinking, right. Come on, come on. You know, um, well, when, when we, you know, when we began to work at Children's Memorial in Chicago, the, the, the patients were different. There were kids with problems, and they were being sent by the subspecialties of pediatrics for to get their dental care done. And uh, boy, some of them were a real challenge. Mm -hmm. And and I'm sure that was the same at Columbus mm -hmm. Children's. And <coughs> so the the specialty began to just converge on this need and get out of that that mood. And we just happened to be there and know that that was coming. Somehow we knew that. I don't I don't know how. And it, you just got lucky, I guess. But, you know, did it the right way, the way we felt comfortable right. doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose we ought to begin to wrap this up, guys. Uh, it was easier than we thought to sit here and talk for an hour. We could probably talk for <laughs> Well, you yeah. are such a wordsmith, well, he, he and he is such a bs <laughs> no, no. that, I mean, I just have so to So is there there. anything you'd like to say in closing? Well, I would, yeah. Uh, I figured you would. You, you know how I always like word. to get the last word in. Yeah. <laughs> I just, uh, you know, it's been a wonderful uh, 28, 27 years for me. I've always been the, the junior member of the group and uh, I'm still thought, in that, is thought of the, as the junior member of the group. And uh, that's in spite of the fact that we've got uh, a full-time orthodontist who's on our faculty, and we're certainly glad to have him. Uh, we have Murray Dock, who's been with us for close to 10 years now. And we've got three really, really good people doing uh, uh, staff dental care for us in the satellites. And I think as you started out talking about how we've come 180 degrees or 360 degrees from the old satellite philosophy, we got out of that business, and now we're back in it again. We have. Uh, three satellites, and soon we'll have a fourth. Uh, and there isn't a bit of donated equipment in None whatsoever. <laughs> and the medical center has been uh, uh, supportive in that regard. Um, and these are state-of-the-art clinics, and uh, the service is being extended back into the community. And uh, It's just a, it's a wonderful group of people that we've, we've put together. We've got a nice staff. Uh, we're now beginning to use dental hygienists, which we've never, never used in the past. And, uh, so 
we, we see a real bright future ahead. Um, even in the uh, eyes and state of man managed care, I think hopefully things are going to be okay. Well, we certainly uh, uh, have done some other things besides dentistry here. I've been with the Southern Gateway Chorus for singing barbershop for over 20 years now. It's an, an Do they have more than four unbelievable. notes in barbershop? Well, there's only seven chords, but I mean, I, you know, it all sounds the same to me. Me too. I, 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 you know, they uh, sing uh, one and song. He, and he it tells me I'm tone deaf. <laughs> but I, you know. No, I, I think you're right. I, I went down to hear him do a concert down at the, oh, where's that, that's down on the river, you know, the Bicent, Bicentennial Park or what. Well, they, they've, they've sung out there with a symphony. I mean, it's a world, it's a world class group. And I tell you, my bet. wife turns to me and says, well, all the songs sound the same. And I said, I think so too. <laughs> you haven't lived until you've gone to a Moonglo. Afterglow. 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 Well, now that I can deal with. Oh, right. I'd and then like you hear that. more of the same. Do you? You know. Oh, I know. It's, uh, and it goes on and on and on. Yeah. We like to sing. Right. We do. Yeah. But do you so like to you sing the fun? same I do too? lots of things for fun. I like to garden uh, primarily, <laughs> and I know Cliff does too. <laughs> but I, I, I like to go to the, I used to go to Red Spring training all the time, and uh, Joe Cox and I, and uh, we've kind of fallen out of that habit, but uh, we used to go down and immerse ourselves for a week in baseball, and we would that. go to three games a day, and it wouldn't do much else. And it was one year, he and I were down there for a week, and I thought we were going to drive each other crazy because it rained the whole time, <laughs> and we didn't have anything to do. And I, those of uh, well, everybody who knows Joe knows he's got to be doing something all the time. I thought I was going to go crazy, uh, but we survived. And uh, I still uh, enjoy the Reds, um, although I wish Mrs. Schott would sell them to someone else. But uh, don't think she's going to. Maybe you guys could buy it when you retire. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, and they're going to trade Brett Boone today. Are they really? I hear that. Hear he's that? On, yeah, I hear he's on the block. Yeah, yeah. for Del Ooh, two right two pitchers. And De Shields, they're going to sign him. Delino De Shields. Yeah, out of who's L.A. He? Oh yeah, okay. The guy that's not supposed to have much of an attitude. Hmm. Mm. Well, let's see. I'm, I I do all sorts of things. Backpacking is <laughs> another. Thing I enjoy when my body allows me to do it. But. Uh, oh, I have a number of things I want to do. First of all, I'm going to take a, a couple of history courses that um, in my early life um, I think I flunked. And I want to go back. <laughs> history and or physics? No, history. <laughs> yeah. I want to go back and learn about uh, European history and American history that I didn't give a hoot about. And since I am computer illiterate, I'm going to buy a computer and Good learn move. about them. Good move. Good for and you. I'm going to get my handicap in the single digits. Is that for nine holes or 18? Steiner. Now that I well, will. I, as, we wrap, well, you know, as we wrap up here, yeah, yeah. I, I think we ought to thank uh, Bill Gerhardt for giving us the opportunity to sit here and do this. I mean, it was well, nice sure. of you to advise to do it, Bill. I appreciate well, he it. Kept, now, he do kept you understand why we call him a wordsmith? <laughs> <laughs> He's the silky-tongued orator, but you know, they're, they're not retired, actually. They're going to be working a couple days a week. I, I want to keep reminding them of that because we're going to need them. We're going to need them in the worst way for a while. We were recruiting faculty, but uh, it's going to be a while before we get them on board. We're going to show you a picture uh, here of the uh, Shell Memorial Clinic. And standing in front of this uh, building uh, with long sideburns, dark hair, Flowing and, hair. and lots of it. Lots of dark hair. Is yeah. Dr. Clifford Steinley and one of our early dental assistants. And you can also see the old building of the Hamilton County Diagnostic Center there. I believe that was Jack's office right up there in the corner, as a matter of fact. Yeah. It's the only one that had air conditioning. Yeah. yeah. So is there any particular wrap-up here? We just... That's all, folks. <laughs>